Well, here we are in Owatonna, Minnesota, and we're here to do uh, oral history with my good friend and fellow veteran Steve Klaus, who I served with in Vietnam in 1969. Steve, first let me thank you so much thank for, you take, for taking the time and driving so far in such horrible weather to join us today. You came farther and, than I did. <laughs> well, that, that's okay. But, you know, uh, what we're doing is we're, I, I've said this many times, our, our uh, service in Vietnam is like a big puzzle. Mm -hmm. And all the guys that were there are the puzzle pieces. Correct. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to complete the puzzle. And our stories is, just, is exactly that. It's going to give a history of our unit and the guys we served with. So it's so important to, I, I'm trying as hard as I can to get as many guys, you know, as I can. Right. So thank you for, for going out of your way to be with us. And I'm, the first thing I'm going to ask is, is what was your, what's your date of birth? Uh, March 31st, 1950. Okay. And where were you born and raised? Uh, born in Washington, Iowa, and raised uh, on a farm about 15 miles south of Washington. So you were a farm kid? Yes. How was that growing up? Great. Did you? Loved it. Loved it. Probably uh, learned a lot, huh? Practi yeah, yeah, practical. Yeah, you had work, and uh, you really didn't have a lot of money. Uh, you know, farmers now, I mean, later on when I got to high school and stuff, that's when we started making a lot more money. Mm -hmm. But uh, it wasn't easy for the parents. I mean, if you're a farm kid, you never go hungry because you got your own produce, you got your own meat. You I was just going to ask you, what were your folks farming? What were they raising? Oh, we had hogs and cattle, and uh, sometimes we'd uh, raise chickens to butcher, and uh, that was pretty much it. And then the rest was row crops, uh, corn. Did mom meat, have a garden? Big garden, an oh, acre, yeah. acre garden. Yeah, we had a big garden, and she canned, and uh, uh, mostly canned. Did, yeah. So you were rural? Right. Did you go to a rural, rural school? Yeah, I went to a one-room schoolhouse, and uh, there was two grades in it. And uh, by the time I got in sixth grade, I went to a different school that had uh, a bigger school. And then I went uh, seventh grade, I went to Mount Pleasant Junior High, and it was, uh, oh, I think my graduating class was 200 in it. And how far was that from home? 11 miles. Oh, so it was where all those schools were within shooting, yeah, shooting yeah, distance, yeah. 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 And uh, so growing up as a farm boy, of course, you learn so many practical things in life. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I've always found that farm kids just seem to have a better handle, you know, when they get older. They seem to be more stable. They seem to be, uh, right. it, they can fix stuff. I yeah. mean, they, ju they just have a, you Well, know, you still have to have the innate ability to be like a carpenter but you can rough carpenter you yeah. know you can yep. uh, like say you learn how to drive a tractor uh, when you're young you uh, we we even had cows we milked by hand but we just milked them and then uh, I think they separated the cream and sold the cream and I think we fed the milk butter yeah mm -hmm. but I think we uh, fed the milk to the hogs <laughs> sure you know after, which is common yeah, yeah pretty typical and did you volunteer for the Army, or were you drafted? I volunteered. And tell me about that. When, when was that? Uh, well, I'd graduated in June, May, whatever, and uh, I had a couple of my best friends had went in the service. I was already in the service, and I never paid no attention to the draft, but I got, they had a special thing going on where you could go down and sign up for two years and pick when you wanted to go, and uh, said there was no guarantees, said you'd probably end up infantry. Well, I thought that might be okay. I wasn't too smart. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, no, I was a two-year RA. Yeah, okay. And uh, that's interesting that a couple of your buddies had already, and they joined, I'm assuming, didn't they? One went in the Marine Corps, and the other one in the Army. Okay. And so how old were you when you got? 18. Okay, so you were 18 years old. What were you doing at the time when you got when you when you went in and signed up? Working construction. Okay. So uh, you were on your own at that? Were you still living still at home? Still living at home. Yeah, but I just I was working uh, construction jobs. I think we were doing pipelines then. Okay. And 
So when you made the decision to go in the military, what, what were you feeling? Were you feeling like, I want to do my duty, or was it just I want to get it out of the way? What, what were you thinking? That, uh, say, like say, we grew up, you did too, uh, with uh, parents that were World War II, and that was kind of a honor to do that. Kind of a duty? Kind of, yeah. And uh, I think you did as much to make parents proud. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also had, like say, two good friends that was in that I uh, might not have ever had the same relationship with them if I never went in when they did get out. That's you true. know, so. And I was drafted, and you know, a lot of people ask me, uh, "Were you mad? You know, were you? <laughs> did you want to go to Canada? You know, and all that stuff." And I remember specifically, I was in San Diego, California, and I was going to college, so I was on a deferment. I didn't have to go in the army, and then I decided it was more important to make money and chase girls. Yeah. And when I did, I dropped out of college, and I didn't realize that the college had a responsibility to the uh, government to give them a list of names of the dropouts. Really? I didn't. And, and guess where? who got called next? You did. Well, I, I got my letter. And, you know, I, I wasn't mad. I, I, you know, I kind of felt like, wow, what have I gotten myself into now? Mm -hmm. But I felt a sense of patriotism. Oh, I did too. I did, you know, and, and I think I don't hear that much these days. Uh, people don't feel that way too much these days, except for the people that's in. Yeah, and, and so when I went to Vietnam, I honestly believed that we were over there to fight communism, and, and uh, I didn't know much more. I, ha I wasn't following Vietnam. No, I, I was somewhat, because it's on TV. You know, but, uh, and like I had my, my friends were in, and yeah. uh, actually I had three Finn, and two of them was already in Vietnam, so I kind of knew what they were going through, but, uh, you know, it's a life's a ride, so you... Yep. The, the first time I thought about Vietnam, I had graduated high school, and there were twin brothers, the Testa brothers, and we hung around a lot together during high school. And at the day after graduation, Eddie went down and signed up for the Marine Corps. And everybody, you know, you still hang around with the kids from high right. school a little bit after you get out. You know, you, everybody just doesn't go their separate ways. And everybody went, why in the world would he do that? You know, why would you just, day after graduation? So then nobody thought about it anymore. And apparently he went through basic and AIT, and he was infantry, of course. And... Uh, he was in Vietnam two weeks, and he got shot right between the eyes. Wow. And that came home, and that got out in the, on the grapevine, and it shocked. I mean, this mm. is somebody, my, my friend, you know, and that's the first time I ever really started thinking seriously about Vietnam, and I knew it was a bad place. I see. As far as striking home for me with Vietnam is... Uh the first person killed in Des Moines County, which is the county I come from, yeah. was Randy Brockway. And that really made, because uh, my uncle and stuff, we knew the families and stuff like that. So so Brockway was, was close to where you were at? Yeah, about 15 miles. I had no idea. So it was kind of a, it was pretty exciting to meet his son. Scott, yeah. yeah. I mean, that must, for you, that must have been. Well, I didn't know Randy personally. But I knew other people that did that had been affected. And I didn't go to the funeral or nothing, but I just know the headlines and, oh, it, it, and the talk. It, small the, town, boy, that it hits yeah. like wildfire. And where did you go to basic training? Fort Polk. Okay. And what do you remember specifically about getting off the bus? I'm assuming they bust you in there. Yeah, they did. And then here there's some DIs out there. What, what do you remember about that experience? Well, the thing I remember first is driving through that uh, Leesville and looking out and uh, see where I grew up. I mean, uh, it was pretty much all white and uh, not so down there. You know, I mean, here I, I look out and here's a guy, a black guy with his leg off and he's shining in shoes. And then, like I say, once we got to the base, I mean, it's same as usual, you got your corporals yelling and screaming and uh, 
trying to scare you, and uh, I guess they kind of do. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, you start thinking, what did I? I, I think the biggest shock for me is when they shaved my head. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't like that. Everybody remembers that. Well, you look at yourself and you think, holy cow, you're ugly. You know, you, you really don't want nobody, <laughs> nobody to see you, you know. Yeah, that's true. But So what do you remember about learning in basic training? Uh, what, were they, what were they teaching you? In basic, uh, well, how to make a bed, how to... Uh, make a foot locker. Uh, as far as tearing down a rifle and uh, march, uh, to the rear march, to the left, you know, I mean, just what everybody The drills did. with the, the drills. rifles and all that, marching yeah. and then the drill. Uh, right. Okay. And then uh, I'm, I'm assuming you remember the physical aspect of basic training. Yeah, I do. Uh, and believe it or not, you might think I'm being facetious, but uh, they had a situation where if you scored, I think it was like 500 on your PT test, there was like two of us or three of us that did. We actually got to go into town hmm. for like a night or so. Which and was a huge thing. Yeah. I mean, at that time. Well, and the thing they said is don't go to this one place. First place we go is there. <laughs> well, what happened? Uh, it was an eye opener, you know. It was more or less a, a bar slash uh, cat house. Okay. You know. Okay. I mean? So, uh, you know, you're a young kid from Iowa. You never seen nothing like this. And <laughs> that's it. That's me and this it. other guy was smart enough. We uh, we drank some beer and, and left with the one guy. Uh, he didn't, and we're standing in formation the next morning. Well, here comes a taxi pulling off. Here, this guy comes with his khakis on. <laughs> He's got a arm halfway ripped off. He evidently got worked over, but... Oh, my gosh. Uh, he's seen no worse for the wear. Yeah, you know, I'll, be, I'll bet he got in trouble, though. I, I don't the think... I, D.I. probably got on him. I don't think too much. Yeah, I'm sure they did, but it's... Uh, they wasn't wanting us to fail out. They didn't want us to finish up and, yeah. you know, so... It wasn't, it wasn't as bad as what it could have been, I guess. But. So you you know that when we were in AIT, we did not, or basic, we did not know what our MOS was going to be. They didn't do that till just right. before graduation, and then they got everybody and called out what. Did you in at any time think you might do something other than infantry? No. What, why not? Uh, well, when I was down there for Polk, uh, that's they, they, they basically <laughs> said that that's infantry. like 70% of the people are... Yeah, that's the message I got. You know, so uh, I just kind of accepted that aspect of it. Where did you go to AIT? Fort Polk. Oh, so you stayed right there. I never left. Okay, is that where Tigerland is at? Yeah, and Tiger. Did you get a taste of that or not? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that's just basically AIT training. They call it Tigerland, and uh, that's just your infantry training. Okay. D except I think they made it, they tried to make it realistic, like they'd have Vietnamese villages and you guys, didn't you actually try to do maneuvers? And oh, yeah, we had some things where you're, you're moving, you're shooting, and uh, I think they did have some Vietnamese uh, villages, but I don't remember many of that. It, okay. was more, it was more or less a lot of the same stuff you learned with uh, basic only... There was a lot more of uh, setting and looking and trying to detect things in the mm -hmm. booby traps or somebody hiding in the camouflage or something yeah, like that. Yeah, that's right. That's good. But uh, no, I actually never, never had a real problem with any of that. I mean, because I, like I said, I'd been working construction. I, I wrestled some in high school, so I was never really in bad shape. Mm -hmm. uh, it went fairly smooth. Yeah. So after you after you got out of AIT, you found out you were going infantry. Mm -hmm. Did they give you thirty days off? No. I ended up coming home for twenty three. Okay, but you got some time off after AIT. Yeah. What was that like? Crazy. I mean, did you like? Were your folks like, "Oh my God, you're going to Vietnam"? Or well, they kind of no. Uh, it's kind of when you come back and uh, you try to catch up on all these things you thought you'd missed out on mm -hmm, so you're mm -hmm. you're kind of running 
kind of heavy, you know. I mean, you're uh, you kind of you, you kind of have an attitude too. Yeah, well, you just you just <laughs> graduated AIT, and yeah, they took you from being a worthless nobody, yeah, to an uh, a warrior, right? I mean, literally. And uh, see, where I grew up uh, back then, we had what they call conscientious objectors. Oh yes. And, uh, there's a lot of people that was in the National Guard or the Army Reserve that that's the reason they went in it was so they want to go to Vietnam. So uh, the feelings, it ain't like it is now. The, there's more hard feelings. Did you have anybody in that area go to Canada? No. That you knew of? No. I, I would have known if they would have. Yeah. Known. And being, I was in San Diego, California, and of course that's a very highly populated place that right. that was kind of uh, they burn draft cards and I know you know, know. and, and yeah. uh, California is a different world oh it is <laughs> it is but I, I remember guys going to Canada you know yeah, to, right I never knew of any and I never even thought about it I mean personally I never that was not even an option be a huge step you know I mean uh, you'd almost have to have some money to do that wouldn't you yeah and you'd lose your citizen you know you'd, give you'd up, lose it all yeah yeah when did you get to Vietnam? I think it was June 9th of 1969. Okay, and do you, what was your impression when you first got off the bus? Was First at, got off the plane? Yeah, and, and here you stepped foot on, in <laughs> Vietnam. Well, the heat, of course. I mean, the heat. Uh, did you sweat right off the bat? I'm sure I Humidity? did. Humidity? Yeah, I, I sweated. But, I, think, uh, I think you were there, you got there in June? Yeah. Wasn't, that monsoon, wasn't the monsoon starting? Yeah. Hadn't started quite yet, but, but I mean, it, it was raining shortly. shortly yeah, shortly yeah. after. God, I'll never forget the humidity. Oh, my oh gosh, yeah, it was just awful. Yeah, it's like it hits you in the face, yeah. you know, and you think, "Wow, I've got to live in this stuff." And when you got there, as I recall, you went to a replacement uh, station. They, I think they called it. You you went into Benoit and then got trucked over to Long Ben. Is that right? I can't remember. I think most of us. I think most of us did. I can't. Uh, I'm assuming that's where it was because uh, it seemed like we had like four days or five days maybe of uh, training right there before we went out to the. But I thought that was in Coochie. Maybe it, it wasn't. It was Coochie. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Finishing school. Yeah. yeah. Is, is what they call that. And and so, uh, do you remember sitting in the bleachers waiting for your name to be called, and then they would tell you, "Okay, here's your orders. This is where you're going." I don't really remember. I, I can remember anticipating. Uh, you know, I didn't know that much about the different units. Uh, Hamburger Hill had just gone on while I was mm -hmm. home on leave, and I was out on the tractor mowing hay, and I was listening to all the... So I didn't want the 101st. <laughs> you, well, you knew that. <laughs> and then uh, when they said the 25th, and I thought, well, shoot, I don't know nothing about them. You know, this might not be too bad. Sure. So, uh, you got your orders, and where were they sending you first off? To, in Vietnam, you mean? Yeah. I just uh, went out to a Charlie company. And so, all of a sudden, you've wound up as a wolfhound. Right. Do you have any, did you have any impressions? Did anybody give you any people, impressions? People told me. Uh, about them, you know, kind of before I actually went out there. Uh, some people would say, well, they just lost such and such, you know. And I'm, but uh, then the guys, when you get out there, they they kind of tell you about the history of it. And, oh, yeah. uh, the big thing then was uh, a lot of these people had survived the diamond. And uh, that was kind of like a horror story in itself. Yeah. But, you know, uh, you know, you're there and... Uh, like I say, when I first got there, we went on a, some kind of a logger, and I, they gave me an M79. I think I had a rifle first, and then somehow I got switched with an M. said, well, I was a fairly big guy. I suppose it made some sense, because I think I weighed 200 when I got over there. Oh, yeah, you were stout. And then when I come home, <laughs> I weighed 150. But, uh, so that backpack, that rucksack with all those HE rounds and so forth in there, 
Oh. I think we carried 60 rounds. Oh, I'm t I was just about... I, your story and mine are exactly the same. Yeah. I walked into the platoon. Joe Wascom was sitting on the bunker, and he called me over, and he said, you know what? I've got a deal for you. I'll trade you that M16 for this M79, and he says, look what comes with it. Parachute flares, grappling hooks, smoke, gas, and he went... Well, I don't think I had the opportunity. I think they told me. Yeah, that. and so, and he says, and to close the deal, he says, you get this 45. Yeah. The M79. <laughs> yeah. And so, I don't, I just wasn't thinking. And I said, okay. I didn't know anything about the rucksack with the 60 rounds in it. And, buddy, it became a chore, as you know. Well, the only good thing about that rucksack, and you know it because you carried it, when you sat down, you had something yes. to kind of lean yes. back. Yep, yep, yep. You know. And sometimes you would get the weight off by having it up on the mm. berm and kind of sliding down a little bit. Yep, oh, I remember like it was yesterday. But to me, what didn't make sense, I thought, I shot expert. Why would I be carrying an M79, you know? And I thought, well, maybe that'll keep me out of point. Well, that don't keep you out of point and don't keep you out of flying. <laughs> so <laughs> I didn't see the benefit of it, but I only carried it for like a month and a half okay. and they got me a rifle. Okay. Then, but Did you ever get to shoot it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, so yeah. you were... Yeah, we shot it. Okay. And what uh, what platoon were you in first? I think I was, Rat Lake says I was in his platoon. Okay, that would have been what, first? I think, and uh, I know the people that I uh, was around the most that actually uh, I thought a lot of that helped me quite a bit. There were like four people, and Hotchkiss was the guy that, I was kind of signed with, but uh, there's a George, he was a black guy, his last name might have been Watson or something like that, and then there was uh, Ricardo. Zamora. Zamora, yeah. and then there's a Kirk, Kirkland or something like that, and, uh, but I mean everybody treated me really good. Yeah. You know, I had no problem with anybody. Yeah, okay. And so... Walton. George Walton. Oh, yeah. Name. And, you know, he got shot in the head. Well, you told me that, yeah. I, and didn't kill him and went home, and they got him. But he was never quite 100% right. And he had three girlfriends Did he? and got every one of them pregnant. I know that. And so, and after the baby was born, they all left him. Every one of them left him. He raised three little babies he did. by himself wow. and, and his sister. Hmm. And I found her. And she told me this whole history of when he, and she was so thrilled to talk to somebody that knew mm -hmm. him. And because and, I was calling to find him because I wanted him to come to a reunion. And she said George would have absolutely loved getting back to see, you know, to see the guys and so forth and so on. But that, then he passed away. But, uh, yeah, he raised three little babies all by himself, yeah. which is just, to me, amazing. Yeah, it's, it's almost it's a heavy load. <laughs> and, and, you know, we've talked about this before. A lot of times the first and second platoon were always going out together, and, and, and especially when we were low in numbers and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so it was almost like you were going back and forth. You know, yeah, you, yeah. I, I remember you worked with us. Yeah, and uh, see, even then, if you remember right, uh, we even had people that, uh, not many, but there was a couple times where people refused going to ambushes. Well, then they'd have to pick somebody else from another yep. platoon to yep. go. That's right. You know, but uh, yeah, the ones that were going to stay in and do the bunker line or whatever, then they would grab a couple of them. But I can remember uh, going out with Conrad Garcia, and he wasn't in first platoon. Second. Yeah, and. Uh, the only sergeant I really remember, and he might have been later, was uh, his name was Claire Franks. Frank or Franks or something like Chale. that. Chale. Chale. Chale Franks. And, and I, I remember I've, him. I've been looking for him for a long, long time. And Jerry Radelaide. Well, see, Jerry signed my book, but I, I don't remember Jerry. I, yeah. I don't remember you. I, uh, well, Jer well, Jerry told me about Chale. Oh, he did? Oh, yeah. He said Chell was one of the best. He was real good. Oh, yeah. He, he, he said good. he was one of the best. So, 
that's interesting, but that's kind of how it worked. I mean, yeah. And, and so, how long were you in the platoon uh, before they uh, said, "Hey, how would you like to become a sniper?" I got rid of my M79. I did what you said. I read through those letters that I sent my mom, and uh, I think it was August. They sent me to sniper school, and uh, I didn't want to go. But whoever the sergeant was said, well, you really don't have a choice. And then it kind of bit them because uh, they assumed I would come back and be in that platoon. Oh, yeah, yeah. But Brigade gets a hold of you. And instead of me going back to 1st platoon, 2nd platoon, uh, I go back for a little while, then I'm in Alpha Company, <coughs> and they move you all around. So you basically lose a, you lose a soldier, mm -hmm. you know. But... It is, that is what it is, you know, I mean, it's, uh, I'm, I'm sure glad it worked out the way it did that I did it. Yeah. Uh, do you remember the first ambush that you were on when, the, when there was contact, when there was actually a gunfight? Yeah, we, we had more booby traps before we had a gunfight. Uh, I can remember going on a logger for like a four-day logger, and that's, uh, well, that's actually when I got hit. And I hadn't been there probably two weeks, and uh, there's a guy named Smith, he's a sergeant, we had on Sergeant Stripes, and we got shot at from a head drill. Was that Michael Smith? Don't know his first name. Okay. I, but anyway, they said, well, watch out for booby traps, his ground had been kind of tore up, and I says, I don't know what to look for, and he says, follow me. So we got in line, I was behind him, well, he took about five steps, and he stepped on something, Blew his freaking leg off. Well, I got the pieces from it from behind. So I'd say that was the first one that I remember. And then that whole thing, uh, I'm in pain because I got these. Of course. And they don't dust you off. You're carrying everybody else's weapons and stuff. And the next thing I know, we're out picking up pieces of somebody that got blown all to smithery. And then the I think I think his name was Waterloo or something like that. Yep, it was. And then the next thing they named I, a hard spot after him, Mike Waterloo. But we're doing that, and then somebody else trips a booby trap, and I, the sergeant might have been you. Says freeze, we're in a minefield, and we stood there for a little bit, and whoever the sergeant was, says okay, follow me, and he walked us out. And then the next thing I know, we're basically turning around and we're walking right out the same way. But we he came led. In. He led. Yep. And then uh, next thing I know, we're building Chamberlain. So yep. that's that was my early time. So I did start off so good. Do you do, were you ever on an ambush patrol that you guys popped the ambush at night? Yeah. And what what was that first time? What what did you think of that? Um, Chaos. Well, it was only like two people that we popped on. So no, it was didn't last long. No, okay. no, no. Uh, there was a lot more shots fired than needed to be. But, oh, of course. Oh, know, that, oh, sure. Uh, it's a mad minute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, what was your uh, longest, uh, did you ever have recorded distance uh, from, from Sniper? Do you remember some of your longest shots that, that connected? At night, you couldn't really shoot over 300 meters. Okay. In daytime, with that 3 by 9 vertical. See, they, it was delegated in meters, so uh, confirmed-wise, I don't know. Believe it or not, you think more about the ones you miss than the, oh, yeah. than I the one you I don't. Suppose. Did, did you get a special scope for night, like a night scope? Yeah, we had, we had our own assigned. Inf it, infrared, was it? Or was it starlight? It's twilight. Yeah, yeah. And it had a, uh, you had cover on it, but it also had a, a uh, cross in there, and you could... Uh, the reticles or whatever you... Yeah, you could put that cover on, enough light come through. You could practice with it during the day, and then at night you went out. Oh, for heaven's sake, I didn't know that. Yeah, and I, I would switch. During the day, I'd put my day scope on, and then at night, I'd put the starlight on. Oh, yeah. And then, uh, like I say, after a while, it seemed like I was working mostly uh, ambushes, going out every night, yep. you know, with somebody different. So I wasn't having to change uh, the daylight scope. But, uh, and then there again, too, once a month, I'd have to go into the rear and they'd tear my rifle down, mm. and then I'd go out and re-zero it. But as far as uh, exact shot... Was that an M14? M14, but they called it XM21 because it had it'd been in, inlaid uh, 
with uh, fiberglass inside, and I think it had an extra turn. Of course, we used uh, National Match ammunition, which is 220. Silencer? It had a silencer, and I finally took it off because uh, they sent my rifle back in to redo it, give me another rifle. And sometimes you're working with Rangers or something, and they set up completely different than what the, uh, like a, you set up an L-shaped yeah, ambush right. or something. Well, these cats, uh, I mean, that could be the road right there, and here's the brush right here, and they would set right on top of it. And they was set up for the everything close. So I thought, well, I don't need the silencer. If you only shoot once, if you don't see a flash, it's hard to detect where that shot comes from. Oh, of course. You know, so. Oh, yeah, yeah. Did, did you ever shoot tracer rounds at being the sniper? Did anyone ever ask you to throw in a? Wasn't spoke to. They, yeah. They'd only give me 40 shells a month. Oh. And, of course, I grabbed more magazines, and I started uh, getting shells off the M60. And their theory was, well, if it gets that bad, chance are you got people laying around that uh, you can pick their white. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, it kind of makes sense Not, in a way. But nice. Thanks for telling <laughs> yeah. me that. Yeah. So did you ever, did they ever have you go someplace and sit? Like in the traditional sniper movies, you see the guy out there overlooking an area, and then if somebody walks by, boom, the sniper gets him? I never worked by myself. Never worked by myself. Did the snipers do that in Vietnam, or was it just um, because they it was such... They went in towers, but I didn't know any climbing any trees. Uh, but, yeah, we would... Uh, sometimes they would send us to, uh, like, an Arvin Tower. Oh, yes. And they didn't like us there. You'd be amazed what they let walk around, and... Uh, They'd send snipers and they'd shoot into them a little bit while the next night or so that Arvin base would get. <laughs> oh, absolutely. No, no question about it. <laughs> but, uh, no, uh, sometimes we'd work with, they'd send you out on like triple deuce or something with the Amtraks and you'd be by the border. And, uh, yeah, you could shoot at that zone, you could shoot at people. They was far enough away, you could make them run, but uh, you couldn't hardly hit them. Say that most of the time people don't understand either. People ain't standing there like this and say, shoot me. People's usually moving, you know? I mean, yep. Yeah, but, They're on the move. Yeah. So was the first time you ever saw anybody hurt or killed the one that you described where you were walking and the guy stepped on the booby trap? I think we'd run into some booby traps before that actually happened because that, that particular operation, we run into a lot of booby traps. I mean... Uh, and one of your guys got really blown up, apparently. Well, yeah, he got, they got picking, picking up pieces. Yeah. Were you shocked? Were you like... That's after I'd been... And the, and the medic could give me some kind of pills to take away the pain. I was kind of out of it. I was kind of like in uh, Alice in Fairyland. Something, you know? I mean, I'll be darned. It's kind of like, this is going on. This is pretty serious, but... <laughs> yeah. Uh, once, if I didn't take those pills, I mean, it, the pain got so bad. I mean, especially after you laid down and stuff, you know, you'd start, you know, uh, aching more. But Throbbing and... Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was little pieces that hit up in here. The main thing that got me here didn't bother me at all. It was, I don't know if I got my muscles or what. Oh, they're just little tiny pieces. And who do you remember as being the closest guys that you worked with? Who were the, the names that you remember the most? Uh, well, I remember Zamora. I remember uh, Kirk Kirkland, uh, Hotchkiss, uh, Dolly. Dolly got there a little bit after I did. Uh, Franks, Franks, of course, Franks. Uh, and I, I had to remember you and Jim and that. But I, I looked at those letters that you told me to look at, and I never wrote nobody's names down hardly. Uh, yeah. You know, it's it's weird, and uh, you know as well as I do, when you're writing home, you don't really tell your folks Nothing. too much. It you, rained you, today. Yeah, or I've got an ambush tonight, you know, or something. You know, yeah, I mean, it was pretty non-vanilla. Yeah. <laughs> but, and uh, who was the platoon leader at that time? I don't know. Platoon sergeant? Was that Frank's? Yeah. It very well could have been, because I know me and him was really close. Do you remember a Lieutenant Wisner? I remember the name, but the Lieutenant I remember is, uh, he was like a Hawaiian. And uh, he wasn't with us, he's a really good guy. 
you know, and uh, he wasn't with us that long, but he knew karate, and that was kind of like a a foreign thing to us back then. Yeah. Cause, cause I didn't know nothing about it, you know, and the kind of a scary thing, you know, for someone to know that, but he was a great guy. But what happened to him, I don't know. Yeah. Did you get to take an R&R? &R? Yeah, I did. And where did you go? Sydney. Oh, you got an Australia one. You know yeah. how hard that was to get? Well, I didn't take it until, I think, April. I mean, did you, like, have your name in the in the bucket, or how did that work? I just put in for it and got it. Wow. I mean, because that was, like, really hard. You was know? it? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, like I say, I, I Everybody thought, was going to Hong Kong or Bangkok or... I went to Bangkok for a five-day leave. Okay. So I actually uh, ended up with R&R uh, &R and a five-day leave. So when you were in Bangkok, do you remember a place called the Happy Happy House? I I don't. I don't. <laughs> I can remember the whiskey a go go in Australia, <laughs> but I'm sure I was there. Oh know, yeah, sure. Because we, uh, you get a taxi driver and they uh, take you around. Yeah, and it was practically nothing. It didn't cost much. No, uh -huh. you know that's amazing. And uh, do you remember? Was that like you know you go from Vietnam, which is pretty high tense, intense, and then you go to Bangkok. What? Were you able to relax, or were you still kind of uptight? Or Bangkok wasn't too bad. The big shock for me was Australia, because uh, on the on the flight over they said, uh, "Hey, there's some girls, that's real nice girls that would like to meet guys, and uh, you're gonna go out." And so you meet them, and you go out and take them out to a meal. It's a fancy restaurant. Well, farm kid, I. Didn't go out to eat much, you know. I mean, sure, sure. looking at a freaking menu, and I don't know what. <laughs> so I ordered spaghetti. There ain't nothing harder to be. And uh, and it just blew my mind, you know. I'm sitting there because, uh, wow, I think. I think when I was in Bangkok, I think April second had just gone on about two weeks before, and it just, you know, how do you go from this to this? That's what I was getting at. It just completely blew. It's a whole different world, yeah. you know. I mean, uh, of course, they just want your money, but uh, everybody wants your money, don't they? <laughs> yeah. Oh, especially when you're single. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and and quite frankly, in the back of most of our minds, I might not get home to spend it anyway. Yeah. I mean, there was that. I mean, you didn't dwell on it, but there was always that chance, you know, because especially after you started seeing guys get killed. Mm -hmm. You know, you always got the idea. Well, if he could, if he got killed, man, I'm, you know, yeah. why why wouldn't it be me? You know. Yeah, but by then too, you've you've got a lot of confidence in yourself too. Yes. You know, I even uh, like I said, I, I didn't have to, but uh, I'd work with certain uh, platoons and stuff, and I I'd, I'd say, hey, I'll walk point. You know, just because it, uh, you want to believe coming from Charlie Company and going to like an Alpha Company. And, uh, the first ambush we were setting up, they got ponchos. And they're shaking them around. <laughs> yeah, I swear. And, uh, you know, all we ever had was a liner, you know. Yeah. And, uh, so you had to deal with that too, you know, unfortunately. That was an entirely different culture. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that uh, maybe they didn't get hit as much as we did. I don't know. Yeah. I, but they were... Did, uh, it's stuff that we'd got uh, ring for if we'd have done it. Oh, yeah. You know. Did you ever get to any of the diamonds? Never. Uh -uh. So, uh, you know, there was one, two, three. And four. And then four, yeah. Uh, so how many months did you serve with, uh, in particular, with uh, Charlie Company? I'd say I got there in June, and I left in probably August 15th to go to school. So June, July, two and a half months. Yeah, okay. And you were wounded. You got that. Did you get any other wounds besides that shrap? That's it. Okay. And uh, did you receive any awards or citations? Oh, I won, yeah, a couple bronze stars and an Army accommodation medal. What about the CIB? Yeah, I have got that. Oh, everybody got. Yeah. But, and I mean, it, why is it that the CIB seems to be the most coveted infantry. Well, We're talking infantry, right? Aesthetically, it's the most attractive. You know, I mean, it's... And who are, who's the only guys that earned it? 
uh, infantry, people it, that's been in live fire. <laughs> exactly. You had to be in a gunfight before, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And uh, that I don't know why, but the CIB just... Yeah, and see, that's the thing, John, that I think is so unfair about it, though, too, is I think Tony Clark mm -hmm. should have one. I think uh, Oh yeah. Jim Langley should have one. But they were forward to I, I agree. You know? Oh, I, yeah. But, yeah, it's, well, it's it sets above every other metal. I mean, so. Yeah. Yeah. And when did you leave Vietnam? I think June 9th. So one year. seventy, yeah. One year. And uh, do you remember what it was like when you, you, I'm assuming you went back home. I did. What was it like when you got home? Oh, uh, the only celebration I had was uh, my uh, folks and my sisters had come back, and they had a banner on the oh no kidding on the front of the house for me. But that was and welcome, so, and welcome so, home. Yeah, and some neighbors come around, but it uh, it wasn't uh, that was the extent of it. Yeah, when you got to the Air Force Base, when you first touched down, did you see or hear any? But he's saying bad things to We them. come in at night. Oh. We come in at night, and uh, somebody said, uh, hey, we transferred through and dumped their clothes or something. I'm not sure. They, I think they resupplied us. And, no, uh, you're right. Yeah. They said that uh, there's a flight leaving San Francisco or someplace for Kansas City if you get over there. So <coughs> whenever you ate my free steak dinner, I... Oh, yeah. I've I, still got the coupon. <laughs> I still have it, because I, di I didn't either. I didn't... All I wanted to do is get out of there. Right, right. I but, mean... And see, when I grew up, too, it was different than you. When I come home, we didn't have the war protests and stuff going on in the small area that that's I come tr around. That's, that's true. Know, so They were probably still real patriotic, and Pretty much. on Veterans Days they had a parade, yep. and, right? Yep. So uh, did some of your old buddies come around, and were you apt to share war stories with them, or did you pretty much keep it to yourself? Oh, the only people I shared with was other people I've been in. Uh, mm -hmm. No, uh, you can talk, and uh, like I say, the one friend of mine been in the Marine Corps, and uh, you know, I'm sitting there thinking, wow, you know, you guys are supposed to had a lot worse than what we did, and I'm kind of thinking in my mind, I don't, I'm not sure you did. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's kind yeah. of a funny way to look at it, but yeah. I mean, and I'm sure there's plenty that had a lot worse, but sure. Uh, did you have any time left to serve when you got home? I had six months to go. Where did you go? Fort Riley. And what did you do? Well, they put me in a mechanized unit, uh, and we were training to go on some kind of a month operation or something to Germany, a, a, a forger or something they called it, to go over and ship all that stuff over. And it was the first infantry division then, and to play war games. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, I don't really want to do that. So I uh, got a hold of my dad, and he got a petition up, signed letters that he could use me at home with the crops. So I ended up oh, getting yeah. a three-month early out. Oh, yeah. The last thing in the world you wanted to do oh, no. is right. go play a war game. Well, you don't know the language. You I mean, really, I can't even imagine it. Well, and I'll tell you how silly they was, John. Uh, you know, Vietnam, everybody wrote on top of the APCs. When we're training there, you're inside them, Ooh. and that dust still filters in, and it's Ooh. hot. But I mean, why would they? Do you remember what we thought of them in Vietnam? They were caskets. Yeah. If you were in them, you were in your casket. Mm -hmm. Because one RPG to the side, and everybody's cooked. I did like having them around, though. Yeah. You know, I mean, because uh, they could put down some firepower. Oh yeah. Yep. So you got out, and what did you do right after that? You went back to the farm, and, and well. I basically went home for maybe a month, and Dad says, "Well, you need probably need to get a job." <laughs> I went, so I did, and uh, I went and got a job. And back to construction? No, I got a factory job. They were making wire. It was a newer factory, and uh, I was a material manager, and it just wasn't a good situation because there's so many of the people I've seen that uh, had never been in service or uh, and I don't think they like being around me too much and I got my first paycheck and I made 
I think eight dollars more than what I was getting on unemployment. I'm thinking, what am I doing here? You know, <laughs> so make a long story short, I got fired from that job and uh, <laughs> ended up getting called by the railroad, and they uh, called me in right away, and I worked there for 38, 39 years. Never had a day laid off. And the and the railroad was a great job. It paid pretty good, and it has a good retirement and so, benefits. Yeah, yeah, it's the same way in Montana. If you work for the railroad, you got a good job. Mm -hmm. And that's always, I think, been historically the same. Uh, so you became a railroader. Exactly. Were you a conductor, an, an engineer? Electrician. electrician. At which meant what? Oh, we've actually tore them down and rebuilt them electrically, or uh, a lot of it uh, you'd go, oh, like when I was in Galesburg, if a unit's acting up. Uh, you go in, you got a laptop, you plug it in, and it'll tell you what the symptoms are. Oh, yeah. cer certain things that you can check through a process of osmosis, you kind of go through that and uh, find out what it is and you get it fixed. Sometimes you can't. Yeah. But you got another shift coming. So 99% of the people in the United States have no idea what the engine really is called. On the money. It's a motor. Yeah. Because they think when they see the smoke coming out the top, they think a diesel engine's powering. The, well, the, the diesel engine's turning the generator to shoot power. the power to the traction motors. Exactly, it's yeah. a motor. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. So, and so, gosh, that was a long run. Yes, it was. So, when did you get married? I think in. Well, I think. Uh, How old were you? Seventy-two. So. I would have just turned 20. Oh, so just Two. a young just a young guy. Yeah. Where would yeah. you meet your wife? I knew her before I went in service and then when I come back out we kind of got together and uh been together ever since. But, yeah. Uh small town. Uh she was from another town, so you you see people and you know in uh just kind of <coughs> hit it off. When did you start having a family? I think three years after that. And how many kids? Three. Three. Two and girls and a son. What What are their names? Jennifer, uh, Jill, and Ben. And what What have they done in life? I mean, what have they turned out? Well, the oldest daughter is uh, oh, like a, she works in a factory that uh, supplies material, construction materials that she's uh, receives and bills and stuff like that. The other one owns a business in Burlington that uh, it's a package place where people come in to want to send stuff and they'll use her and she uh, can go through UPS. Oh whatever. yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. And yeah. Then, and then the son's a... Uh, a ship it type store. Yeah. It's, yeah. And then my son is uh, actually kind of a pretty far up with the railroad. Uh, he's he didn't take and do what I did. He didn't get in the crafts. I mean, he started off as a conductor, then he became an engineer, then he got into management, and I th he's done real well. Yes. Okay. And then uh, when you got home, did you stay in touch with any of the guys that you served with in Vietnam? No, and I felt, I was telling Jim, but I felt really bad. I had people come out to see me, and I just, I never, I'd, I'd see them, but I never... Recipitated. I never went back, and uh, and like I say, uh, finally Ronnie Dolly sent me a letter back in 2000 to an old address, and that was the first. For heaven's sake. Well, you get thinking in your mind, you know, you don't know exactly where these people are now. Oh yeah, you know, uh, I mean, where and their you heads did, are now. Most of them, when we were there, we didn't know where they were from. No. And no. most sometimes we didn't know what their whole name was. Because there True. was a lot of nicknames and mm -hmm. and stuff, and the other problem was some guys were only there two weeks, yeah, or a month, yeah. and you know you know as well as I do you don't get close to somebody in two weeks. No, you know. No. And uh, what did you think of the first reunion you attended? I thought it was well. Actually, when I sat down at the table, which, I, which reunion was it? What was your first? Is it Branson? Okay. And I sat down at the table, and I told the wife, I says, I don't know a soul here, this table. And it turned out I knew every one of them. 
<laughs> after we got talking oh, and stuff, I mean, abs I looked at their names and stuff. I, I think Jim Langley and Wood. Would absolutely. In a, a, of course, uh, the radio man, uh, Vladimir. Oh, yes. Yeah. But he's one that I remembered, too, when I first got there because he had that European look. Yeah, yeah. And he said, well, I remember you because you, you're one of the few that pronounced my name right, you know, which made me feel kind of good. Sure. But... And uh, so the reunions have been a have been a good thing. Oh, I think they've been wonderful. And uh, and do you think that they've allowed you to make peace with a lot of stuff that happened in Vietnam and kind of get a little a little uh, uh, easier to you know accept the things that happened in Vietnam and so forth? Kind of a. Oh, I think I've probably made peace a long time ago. Uh, it's good to get back with those people and. Uh, you know, talk to them and find out how they're doing uh, stuff. It's it definitely gets you thinking about it again. Yeah. You know, but uh, no, I I'm sure it has. You know. Did you bring home anything from Vietnam? Any tr any uh, trophies or? No, not really. Uh, nothing really. Did you take a lot of pictures? I did take quite a few pictures, and uh, I just had a little. I don't know. I think. A couple of cameras probably got stolen. I, <laughs> sure. Well, I was moving around. Yeah. You know? Oh, I know. Yeah. I and, uh, I remember that. And what is your definition of a hero? Hero is somebody that cares more about other people than they do themselves. Maybe. Mm -hmm. and, Did you know and any? Followed up with words. Did you know any heroes in Vietnam? I think I knew a lot of them. I think I'm set by one. Yeah, okay. And what does the American flag mean to you? It's uh, to be respected all the time. Uh, I do a lot of funerals for veterans. So Honor guard? Yeah. And uh, sometimes when you fold it, when you present that to the widow or mother yes. or something like that, it means the world to them. And I think with the honor guard, I've never done it when you do the taps that, oh. that don't affect people. The shooting scares them, but the that taps, taps... when I hear it, yeah, the hair on the back of my neck stands up every time. What did you think when the NFL started that kneeling business? I haven't watched a lot of football since then, but, but I actually kind of lost interest in it before. And uh, I don't know. I mean, everybody has their own agenda that they're trying to put out there. You know, I just seen uh, some some kid that was like six years old, seven years old, refused to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, and they said, well, well he's getting that from home. Of course. A six, seven-year-old kid ain't uh, thinking no, no, about no. everybody's uh, of oppression. <laughs> yep, yep. And uh, what advice, now you know that this video we're going to put it on our website and I'm I've committed that I'm going to get funding to keep this up for a hundred years because this is a generational what I want is for your kids the grandkids yeah. their kids great great you know I want do you know what ancestry.com is I do okay what if instead of just finding information about somebody you're all these generation of Klauses could actually go someplace and see you in living color. I think that'd be nice. Talking. I think that'd be nice. About their service and so forth. So somebody 50 years from now, looking at your video, what advice do you have for them? What advice do I have for somebody 50 years from now? Uh, Any gener I mean, generations behind, you know, um, come. I guess maybe uh, try to go back to the basics and uh, try to respect your elders, you know, I mean, try to uh, try to be a good person. What else can you do? Yep. You know? And work ethic? Yeah, I, I see no problems with work. Uh, I mean, you, you grew up. Yeah. I mean, as a, as a farm kid, that was your life. Yeah. Uh, Did you ever tell your folks you were going to go on strike? <laughs> I don't think that that worked out too good. <laughs> See, that's why that's uh, like I say, we had 
chores to do, you know, it's like they have now, it's 20 below zero, and don't go outside and don't take a deep breath. Well, I used to get 20 below when I was a kid, we'd be out feeding hay. And oh, yeah, you, you know, had to. We'd be out sledding. Had to. You know? Yep. But. Well, that's good. Now, is there anything else that I haven't brought up that you would like to add to your to your story? Basically, I, uh, everybody that I talk to that's been involved with you and the reunions are very grateful that you, you're the basically the, well, how do you put it, the uh, kind of the creator of mm -hmm. this whole thing or want to be there. And I did go to the Historical Society thing, mm -hmm. 27th Division, it was in Davenport this year, you know. That's a nice. That's a nice thing. It's a, it's a different, a uh, little more drinking and stuff, I suppose, because it ranges in mm -hmm. ages and stuff. But uh, they're all nice. Uh, Charlie Company uh, is a pretty tight outfit. Yeah, you know, just is. The final question that I have for you today is I'd like you to look into the camera and I'd like you, to, like you to tell us what has your wife meant to you all these years? Oh, she probably saved me. <laughs> Kept me out of a lot of trouble. Uh, I, I had a little bit of more of a wild streak. Uh, I drank. Uh, I never had major problems, enough where I missed work or anything, but uh, she constantly kind of kept on me about it and uh, kept me from being a fool. You know, it means the world to me. I mean, uh, you know as well as I do, if you've been with anybody for that long, you're going to have better times and you're going to have worse times. Oh, sure. Uh, How many years you've been married now? Now, 72, and this is 46. I don't know. My math ain't so good. You're you're gonna sir, you're gonna have a fiftieth. Yeah, four years. Good, good Lord willing. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Steve, I just want to thank you with all my heart. Well, thank you, John, for and driving Jim. down and being with us and supporting the reunions. You don't know how important that is. That you know the guys that always come to the reunion, they're the they're the backbone of the whole thing. You know, mm -hmm. you got it's it's you guys. You know. And the very first reunion in Washington, D.C., you know, Laura, my wife, of course, you know, she had done so much work on that and so forth. And I, and I, said, I said to her, I said, you know, this reunion has nothing to do with you and me, Laura. I said, this is all about the guys that, and us. I mean, because I'm one of them. I'm, a, I'm one of the guys, right? So as a reunion, I always have tried to make it to recognize well, see, they, they find out a lot about you, too, by listening to your interactions with other people mm -hmm. and stuff. And I've noticed the wife said, I heard her make a remark one time that uh, she sees how I am with these people, that she hasn't seen that. Uh, I think everybody's a little bit standoffish. Yeah. You know, I mean, and uh, it's if you've spent time and, you know, even if you know that this person wasn't with you, you know that you're usually going to get a pretty straight scoop, and that means a lot. Oh yeah. You know, I mean, and you walked in the the same trails that they did at, mm -hmm. one, at one time or another. Right. You know. Right. So, well, this has just been wonderful being with you, yeah. and and thank you for everything that you do. Well, thank you, John. Okay. Uh -huh.